Perfect. Hi ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia and today we're going to be going through the Beatles. So I have my collection behind me at least, and this is not my entire collection, this is just the Beatles that are behind me. So if we want to take a look real quick, yeah. So we're going to be going through a good number of these, probably up to here is where I've identified these handful down here. I'm still working on identifying and probably could throw them in the, still working on them. All right, but yes, we're going to be covering all of the, we're going to be covering a handful of different families of beetles today. Um, I definitely love them. So uh, a lot of my collecting does focus on, on things that will bring in beetles, um, beetles and moths really. Um, so I like to, uh, black light, I like to, um, put, um, pitfall traps. I like to put, put pitfall traps down and a number of other things that will allow you to get, to get, um, beetles. Love them. All right. So, um, just like previous live streams, we're going to be chatting about, we're going to be chatting about them and then I'll be writing characteristics over here just so that you can keep track of them in case you are using this for a future or in case you're using this to identify or in case, I don't know, what are you guys using this for? I'd like to know. All right, so, um, Coleoptera. Coleoptera is the name for, is the Latin name for the order of beetles. So all of the beetles are coleopterans. Um, coleo is from, is, is rooted in the word coleus and it means sheath or hard. And, um, P-T-E-R-A is rooted in wing. All right. So when you've got the coleoptera, you're looking at insects with hard or sheathed wings. All right. That's the characteristic that the order is named for. So if we're talking about beetles in particular, all beetles, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little vocab word here. Why not? Uh, decrease the font just a little bit. Um, all beetles have what we call elytra and these are the hard outer shells or they are also the first pair of wings, right? So beetles are going to use their elytra, their, out, their first pair of wings, to actually protect the membranous wings underneath. They're considered wings. They do open during flight, but they don't ever flap, right? Um, the hind wings are used to actually fly, the, me the flight mechanism. All right, so um, we have a variety of carabids to look at today. Carabidae are the Latin, is the Latin name for ground beetles. All right, looks like we're going to go a little bit smaller. There we go. All right, so um, we're going to look, we are going to be looking at the carabids today or the ground beetles first. And so let's go and check those out. Ha! All right, he's cool. All right. Doop, doop, doop. Um, there are a number of different um, types of ground beetles out there. I wanted to show you this guy. He's definitely one of my faves. He is called a fiery searcher. He likes to hunt caterpillars, so he'll um, run around at nighttime, and he is predatory, so he's going to be eating all types of caterpillars and being he hunts for his prey, right? And he's got all of these really, really beautiful metallic colorations down his back. I love that his legs are blue and he's got that red highlight around his elytra. Um, all right. Uh, ground beetles can also be really boring, right? Ground beetles can also just be this flat black color. All right. So we've got this boring kind of flat black color. We have those really pretty colors. Um, there are also some ground beetles or some carabids that are metallic. All right. And we'll be talking about these separately because they were actually just placed, they were placed into this family. They used to be a separate family. These are the tiger beetles. All right. 
And so when we're looking at ground beetles, you can see that there is this huge variety or there's this huge diversity in ground beetles that might make it kind of difficult to tell if you are looking at a ground beetle or if you're looking at some other type of beetle, right? Ground beetle that's flat black or this one that looks like it should be flat black until you get it under the microscope and then it's metallic green. What? That's gorgeous. All right, so now you've seen there's a number of different species of ground beetles and they have these variety of different colorations. Well, a character that all ground beetles have we actually have to flip the ground beetle upside down. All right, so I like to make sure that I get a little bit of museum tech on the center of my, um, on the center of my microscope. That one helps me know where the center is, and two is going to help me put the pin upside down so that you guys can see the characters. All right, move it just a little bit. Just to blow what my mom would say, just a skosh. Just a little itty, itty bitty bit. There we go. All right, he can stop spinning now. That's the only thing about putting them in the museum putty is they tend to move. It's not like putting them in, a, in styrofoam where they're gonna hold their place. There we go. Closing in on being able to see it. There we go. Perfect. Alrighty, so let's check this out. This is our ground beetle. This is the bottom side or the ventral side of our ground beetle. If you're looking, he's got his front leg, his middle leg, and his hind leg back here. And we have, we've got to talk about the, um, the pieces or the parts of an insect leg. All right, so first we have right here, this is the femur. All right, right here, this is the tibia, and after the tibia, this is where the tarsi or the toe pieces start. All right, moving backwards, we've got these tarsi, we've got these tibia, we've got these femur, and then this piece right here is the coxy or that hip bone that we've talked about in a couple of different families. Like last Thursday, we talked about the coxy of um, uh, the hip bones of some wasps, right? Now, these are, this is the coxy. Well, in between the coxy and the femur, normally there's this little itty itty bitty segment called the trochanter that I pretty much never mention because it's so itty bitty tiny. Well, in carabids, it's super enlarged. So you see this piece right here that looks like it's really big, almost it's like another segment of the leg. That is supposed to be the trochanter, and normally they're small. Now, in carabids, that's the key characteristic for carabids. They've got this, we call it, an expanded trochanter on the hind leg. All right, and that's a characteristic that you're going to see in every single carabid. So, oh, this is also a characteristic that I have to take the labels off of the specimens to see. So let me put this label back on really quick. And then we can look at it on the fiery searcher or that metallic one. Where's the hole? There it is. All right. So we're going to be looking at it on the fiery searcher. And I think we can actually see it on the fiery searcher without removing the, because it's big enough. Very good. So pretty. All right, ladies and oh, hey, come back. It just got all dark on me here. Oh, we're going to play with.
with exposure really quick to make sure that this metallic comes through. Perfect. All right, so if we are looking at the bottom side of our fiery searcher, we're looking at this hind leg right here. This is our coxie, this is our femur. We're look here, that looks like this like expanded little thing. That's the expanded trochanter, and that is the characteristic for the family of carabids. Every single carabid has this on their hind legs. And if you wanted to, we can even flip over a tiger beetle. Let's see. Let's flip over a red one. All right. So if we wanted to look really quick at the top of our friend before we flip it over. So this is um, a, a more red or a yellow tiger beetle rather than that metallic green blue that I showed you earlier. I love tiger beetles. I feel like, all right, let's talk about tiger beetles for a minute. Tiger beetles are a type of ground beetle, so unfortunately they don't get their own family anymore. But I imagine tiger beetles like the vampires of the insect world, all right? If you think about like a vampire, they're supposed to be like the best predator of humans right so they're supposed to be like really pretty so they're attractive to humans and they're supposed to be so so fast that you can never catch up with them and they're supposed to be incredible predators that have the ability to eat pretty much anything right what else what other characteristics are there yeah pretty much that and let's see my tiger beetle is absolutely gorgeous he's got all of these metallic colorations and um, this is a structural color, so they never loses it. You'll see the dentations or the pockets in the exoskeleton. Oh man, and the lines up there on the head. Um, all right, so they have these beautiful colorations. Tiger beetles have the ability to run incredibly, incredibly fast. All right, tiger beetles can actually run so fast that they cannot see while they are running. They have to stop and look around and kind of try and figure out where they are. Um, and I think that that's really funny about tiger beetles. Imagine kind of going into hyperdrive or like um, faster than the speed of light, they say, right? So they're going warp speed and um, just like all of the stars that are rushing by your face during warp speed, that's kind of how tiger beetles see. Their brain doesn't have the capability to put pictures together as fast as they have the ability to run. Um, so that's kind of cool about them, and they're epic predators. They've got these huge mouth parts, they've got these huge mandibles, and they have the ability to pretty much eat any insect that they come across. And if we are looking at that hind leg. I'm holding the pin this time because I want to be careful with my tiger beetle. I don't want it to get hurt. But if we are looking at that hind leg, you can see I have to let go of them. Hands are too shaky. Right about here, you can see where this is the coxy, this is the femur, and right about here, that's the expanded trochanter that all carabids have, even tiger beetles. So that's probably one of the reasons why they were smashed together, but also there was a bunch of, um, there was a bunch of genetic work done and they found that the tiger beetles kind of fit right into the middle of the carabids, so they kind of had to include them in the family. All right. So, we have, let's get this light on really quick, all right, we have a variety of different carabids that I can, sh I have a variety of different carabids that I can show you, from um, red, black, metallic, and then over here, the tiger beetles. 
I've collected tiger beetles all over the country. So these are from, let's see, Nebraska, New Mexico, Texas, Iowa, and Pennsylvania. Cool. Alrighty. Now, let's get that characteristic up here. They have... They have an expanded trochanter on the hind leg. And that's what we've been looking at. All right, the next family that we're going to be getting into are the Gyrinidae. And these guys are also known as the Whirligig beetles. All right. These guys are the party beetles. They spin in circles all the time. All right, gyrinids are whirligig beetles. They are aquatic. So um, I don't know if I've ever collected, I don't know if I've ever collected whirligig beetles outside of um, aquatic situations, although they do have wings, so they have the ability to move from one water system to another. And many aquatic insects that are like that as adults will fly at nighttime. So I'm not sure if they fly at night, but I haven't seen it yet. All right, so whirligig beetles, they're going to be aquatic. Um, they are always spinning in circles. I swear, it's what they do. It's their favorite thing ever. Now, they also like to spend most of their time skidding along the top of the water. And we'll talk about why that is. So if you imagine like a really, really fast boat going um, straight, you have that water that gets pushed off to the side. That's what whirligig beetles do as insects. They go so fast that they like swoosh water out of the way and you can watch their trails all over the place. It's great. All right, now, um, the, those, are all, those are all characteristics about like what their behaviors or what they do or where they can be found, right? But if you want a physical characteristic that you can see on the specimen, they are the only beetle that has four compound eyes. Let's check this out. All right, let's see. Doop, doop, doop. I got myself a new piece of paper. Last one was getting kind of dirty. So what we are looking at here is the top of the head. So this is my whirligig beetle. You can see right here, he's got a compound eye. And you can imagine that on the other side of his body, he's also got a compound eye on the top. Now, you'll notice that he has this ridge right here along the side of his head and along the side of his pronotum and then his elytra, right? So he's got this ridge. Now, this ridge is what he'll use to, is um, essentially where the water line is going to be, right? So he swims with this ridge on the edge of the water line. So he has this eye that's actually above water that he can watch above water and make sure that he is safe. Now, if I angle him slightly differently, If I angle them a little different, you'll notice this right here. On the underside of this ridge, he has another compound eye, all right? And this eye faces down into the water. So whirligig beetles are really cool, not only because they are an insect that is pretty much permanently spinning in circles, um, but also they have the ability to see above the water and below the water at the same time. That is pretty much the coolest thing that I know about whirligig beetles. Look at how fun that is. 
And it almost looks like on this species, the the compound eye that's on the underside is even larger than the compound eye on the top of the head. Yeah, so that's going to be your characteristic. Um, every... So that's going to be your characteristic. Every single um, gyrinid, every single whirligig beetle has two compound eyes on the top of its head and two compound eyes on the bottom of its head so that it can see above and below the water. Wild. All right. So outside of the whirligig beetles, we have another aquatic beetle that I'd like to talk about, and those are the holiplidae. Or the holiplids. Now these are called the crawling water beetles. And that's just going to have to be on two lines. Because I don't think that's, that I'll be able to shrink that enough. Alright, so. We are looking at the holiplids. Let me see if I can see this characteristic without taking the label off. Look at that. Perfect. Cool. All right, let's look at these. Now, um, holiplids, we're going to tell you that they have expanded coxy before I show you it, just so that it can have it written down. Let's see. So, they have expanded coxy that are going to completely, completely conceal at least two segments on the abdomen. And a lot of times the, the, the holiplids will conceal even more than two segments. The coxy are huge on these crawling water beetles. All right. Crawling water beetles also tend to be um, a smaller family of beetles, so you don't, there generally aren't really, really big holiplids out there. Okay, so let, we are looking at the underside of this beetle. All right, the um, foreleg, the first leg is here, the middle leg's about here. And then you kind of wonder where the hind leg connects. You're like, what the hell? Where is the hind leg? We know that every single leg connects to the thorax. There are zero legs that ever connect to the abdomen. So it's got to connect up here somewhere. And so what we're looking at, up a little bit, there. What we're looking at is right here. That's the hind leg, and it's going underneath this crazy looking plate here. This plate is the coxy. All right, so that is the hind leg, or the, this is the, the hind, essentially the hip bone, right? The place where the femur connects. But it's super, super expanded. You can see that this hind leg actually has the ability to go all the way up here and has full movement and can push all the way through. And I imagine that having the ability to push their legs through this entire space probably makes them really great swimmers, right? So this might be a characteristic that really helps with their swimming abilities. But what we know is if you see these huge plates that are kind of covering where the hind leg connects, those are expanded coxy. And on this beetle, I can only see one abdominal segment, um, whereas he probably has five or six. Right? I'm not sure how many he has under this coxie. It would be hard to see. But that's going to be the characteristic for all holiplids. They have these expanded coxie. Cool. And that's going to be something that you're going to have to see on a microscope, right? Because if you're looking at a specimen that's I don't know, that big? It's going to be a little bit more difficult to see that, that characteristic with the naked eye.
You kind of can. If you know what you're looking for and you have a and you have a, a magnifying glass, you probably could see it. I had an aquatic entomology professor that always brought a pocket magnifying glass, and he would use it to help him identify um, families of um, aquatic insects or aquatic insects to family. All right, I want to stick with the aquatic beetles situation we've got going here, right? We started with ground beetles. Ground beetles are awesome. Um, ground beetles, whirligig beetles, um, crawling water beetles, and the next one we're going to do, which are the ditiscids. These are going to be the predaceous diving beetles. The diticity. Give myself some space. All right. When we're looking at the diticids, we're going to have to be looking at two separate characteristics because the diticids and the hydrophilids tend to look very similar. We've got two different families of aquatic beetles, one being the diving beetles, the other being the scavenger beetles, that do look very similar. Um, the predaceous diving beetle has filiform antenna. And if you're not sure about what what I mean by when I say filiform antenna, I have a YouTube video about insect antenna, guys. Um, no, filiform antenna just mean long, straight, thin, kind of like a hair, filiform. Um, just kind of straight. A lot of insects will have filiform antenna, like, let's see, grasshoppers, praying mantids, they have filiform antenna. All right, and then we're gonna be looking at we're gonna be looking at the mouth parts. All right, so um, this is called the maxillary palpi, but I'll give you I'll give you guys a little 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 tip about insect mouths. All right, insect mouths are kind of broken down into a bunch of pieces. You have the labrum, which is like the top lip. All right, you've got a piece that comes down like this. That's the labrum. Then you've got the mandibles. Those pieces do this, right? They can kind of chew, um, especially with a lot of these beetles have chewing mouth parts, right? So they've got their mandibles that they can chew. Then they have a, um, they have their palpi, their labial palpi, their maxillary palpi. And what those are, are essentially mouth fingers. <laughs> That's what I like to call them. And so these palpi are like these two little things up here in the front. They can maybe have four, but a lot of times they have two. And they take them and, and they do this with them. And it helps them take food from where their mandibles can't reach it and push the food towards their mandibles, right? Their front lip is on top. They have an underside lip or a, or a bottom lip. And then they have their palpi and their mandibles. All right. And so these guys have very, very short palpi. All right. When we're looking at our next family, we're going to be seeing that their palpi are actually longer than their antenna, which is wild. All right. The other thing we're going to say, we're going to say that they don't have a keel, except that you don't know what a keel is until you see it on the next specimen. It'll be fun. It'll be like a game. All right. Let's do the big guy. Wait a minute. Yeah. Alrighty, so we are going to be looking at this predaceous diving beetle. And I just want to give you guys, I will show you what I mean by they look very, very similar. So this is the predaceous diving beetle. And then the next one that we're going to be looking at, the hydrophilid is a water scavenging beetle. All right, those are in two different families, all right? Those beetles are different enough that they actually have significant characteristics and there are thousands of each different type, all right? Um, so that's why we need to know very specific characteristics because sometimes the insects look very, very similar. Okay, so let's check out the long filiform antenna first. My 
my microscope says too much light. All right, so that is going to be, this is going to be your long filiform antenna. All right, you can see that it's kind of long and straight. It has individual segments, but um, antenna are going to have that because the exoskeleton can't bend, right? So the antenna bend at the segments. And then, if we look up closer to the front of the head, I'm actually going to turn this brighter one off. It was blowing out our specimen. All right, now if we're looking at, this is the head of our hydrophilid, or, or loop, 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 that's the head of our diticid, right? This is the predaceous diving beetle, so we have this filiform antenna right here, and then this right here, that little segmented piece, and this little segmented piece right there, those are the mouth fingers, all right? Those are the palpi, the maxillary palpi, and in this family, you can see that the palpi are shorter than the antenna, all right? Antenna long, palpi short. And if we flip the specimen upside down, we're not going to see it super well in this picture, but if we flip the beetle upside down and we're looking right here in between the legs, there's not going to be any type of keel there. Um, and we're going to be seeing that on the next specimen. I just wanted to show you that it wasn't there, but as it turns out, that specimen was a little bit more difficult. So we have those characteristics, those predaceous diving beetles, those long straight antenna, those short maxillary palps, no keel. All right. Um, all of the families that we've talked about so far are in the Adaphaga um, group of beetles. And then we're going to move into the Polyphaga when we talk about the hydrophilids or the water scavengers. All right. The water scavenger beetles are going to look very similar to our diving beetles. All right. They can be larger. They can be smaller. They can be, <laughs> um, they can't be purple or brown. Sorry, guys. They can be brown. They can be blue. They can be violet sky. All right. Water scavengers. Sorry, I got distracted by TikTok. Thoughts? How many people out there get distracted by TikTok? Too many, probably, huh? All right, so we've got these water scavenger beetles, and the water scavenger beetles will have a keel. And we will check that out. I think it's really kind of the coolest thing. The keel on the bottom side of the abdomen, on the bottom side of the insect, actually helps them helps them swim, or it helps like kind of guide their swimming. Um, the other thing that they have are, instead of having filiform antenna, they're going to have clubbed antenna, and they have they have long maxillary palpi. So we've got a keel, we have antenna with clubs on the end instead, and we have really long mouth fingers. Let's check them out. specimen I think will be easy to see it on. Now 
this is a characteristic that is pretty easy to see while the insect's alive because their antennae are moving and their pulpy are moving. Um, once they are passed away like this, you kind of have to track down the body parts. Yes, the light on this specimen, though, helps wonders. focused up here, moving down, perfection. We're going to look at this side of the head and then we're going to flip over to the other side to see if we can find um, an example where this leg isn't in the way, but um, we can look right about here. This is our hydrophilid, and the antenna connects right here in front of the eye. This is our compound eye. This is the base of the antenna, and the antenna comes out, and you see it, it has this club on the end of it. The last segment is expanded, whereas the other antenna was all straight, right? So that's going to be our first characteristic. All hydrophilid are going to have these kind of clubbed antenna. And then secondarily, they've got long mouth fingers that are longer than the length of the antenna. So if we are looking at the maxillary palp, um, you're looking right about here. It's underneath. This is the mandible. This is the upper lip. So this is the upper lip. This is the mandible. This is the maxillary palp. This is the labial palp. And then this is the, uh, uh, the bottom lip. Okay? All right. So this right here is the palp that we want to be looking at. It's the maxillary palp. And... You can see it continues on, it goes, it goes, it goes, and it goes even further, and I have to change the focus a little bit so that you can see that it comes all the way out to the end way over here. All right, so this maxillary palpi is significantly longer than the antenna. That's the characteristic that we're looking at. The maxillary palpi is longer than the antenna. Now, um, that is a characteristic that is always true and super handy and super helpful. Um, but I kind of want to show you this keel because I've always thought that this was a cool, like, insect structure. Um, I like to say a lot of times when we figure things out, insects had figured them out first. All right. They have, um... Ants, for instance, were the first people to do, uh, oh man, you lost a leg. That's going to happen when you're working with insects. I'll have to glue it back on. Okay. I went to take off his, um, I went to take off the label so that I could show you his body, and unfortunately he lost a middle leg. If we are looking at the underside of my hydrophilid, we can see, sadly, this is where my leg broke off. He's going to have to, actually, I can probably glue it back on under the microscope. That'll be fun. All right. Um, we have right here, this is the keel. All right. This is kind of an expanded piece on the thorax that helps them, that helps them go in a straight line, I guess. Um, I know it definitely helps with swimming, and a lot of times these keels will come out to a really fine point, and this fine point is actually separate from the abdomen. So if I look at it at a s little bit of an angle, if I look at it a little bit of an angle, you can see that this point right here um, actually is no longer connected to the abdomen. Let's see, it stops right about here. And then this is kind of like a short stabby point. Yeah, it doesn't use it to stab. And all hydrophilids are going to have this kind of expanded keel. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to glue this leg back on under the microscope. That sounds fun. All right, so, um, I have my handy 
handy dandy glue here. Um, I generally just use Elmer's glue if I've got it handy. Um, and there is a trick. There is a trick to being able to um, to glue with Elmer's. A lot of people use tacky glue. Let's see. This. A lot of people use tacky glue because it's already kind of sticky. Although for me, tacky glue goes bad so quickly because it's kind of too tacky. Whereas I can kind of take an Elmer's bottle and squeeze out a little bit of glue like you know, our teachers never told us to do and kind of put it on the side of the nozzle. And I'll actually let a little bit of glue dry so until it's tacky, right? So Elmer's glue comes out super, Elmer's glue is kind of runny for as glue goes. Um, but if I wait until it's about tacky, then I can, then I can pick up the leg with it. Perfect. All right, so we've got the glue. We're going to go in. I'm going to show us the microscope. All right, so I've added a little bit of glue to the leg. I'm going to go in and add... I'm going to go in and add a little bit of glue to where the leg should be connecting. All right, and then I'm going to take the top of my pin. I'm going to put it right here where the connection is supposed to go. All right, so it's connected. Now I want to make sure, I, w I like to try and make sure that the uh, leg stays kind of even with the next door neighbor's leg. Might be a little difficult on this specimen. There we go. Yeah! Alright, so we are going to be... So we will let that connection dry. And then we'll be able to, well, treat our specimen even nicer because we don't want to knock that leg off again. And that's how to glue a leg back on. I really actually, I like using a microscope when I'm gluing things back together. I like to use the microscope when I'm gluing things back together just because it helps you with, um, it helps you with precision. Very good. Tucking the leg in a little bit. That's better. Now I gotta put the labels back on. And that was actually why he lost his leg in the first place, is because I was taking his labels off. I really wanted to show you guys the keel, but I got that taken care of. So I'm going to go through and just throw these, um, the predaceous diving beetles and the hydrophilids on the microscope just so that you can see them all going through. Let's see. All right. So we have the guy that we, we're starting with the predaceous diving beetles, right? Those long filiform antenna. We got him. This guy with kind of this lighter band around the outside of his body. This one is really super cool because he he's kind of this lighter coloration in comparison to everyone else is kind of that dark black. And you can see he's got those long antenna. And if you look at his hind legs, his hind legs are cool too. He's got those really awesome long hairs on his hind legs that help him swim. And both hydrophilids and dytissids will have these long swimming hairs on their hind legs. That makes those legs natatorial or swimming legs. I don't know if any of you um, have backgrounds in Spanish, but nadar is to swim. And that's how I remember swimming legs as natator natatorial. All right. And then we have 
the water scavengers, right? So these guys are, are going to have the clubbed antenna instead of the filiform antenna. And, and they are going to have those really long um, maxillary palpi or mouth fingers. Cool. All right, so we have those guys. So we have those aquatics taken care of, and that's the end of our aquatic beetles for today. We're going to be moving on to mostly terrestrial beetles. Um, the next one that we're going to be going through, let me get through my list. All right. The next one we're going to be looking at are the hysterids or the hyster beetles. Um, these are beetles that I've always found spelling add the dictionary all right these are the hyster beetles I've always found hyster beetles underneath um, bark on trees that's where I have generally found them but uh, no no but that's where I found them sorry guys let's see <laughs> I'm curious how many of you out there are watching? No. No one's out there. That's okay. You guys will see afterwards. Okay. So, we have my hyster beetles. My hyster beetles are... Flat, kind of wild-looking beetles. <laughs> I have wondered why they call them hyster beetles like what does hyster mean, mean exactly um, I feel like it's the same base as hysterical but I don't know what it is alright these guys are I don't know how to tell we're just going to say they're super flat like they are, hyster beetles tend to be incredibly flat. Um, they have shorter elytra than their body. So if you're looking at those first pair of wings or that outer shell, that is not going to, you're going to see a couple of abdominal segments after it. All right, so that's a characteristic. And then... The front tibia, or we're talking about femur, tibia, right? The front tibia is flat and toothed. All right. And a lot of times, the, the friends that I have found, they all of their legs are flat and toothed. So I don't know why my characteristics that I've written down specified the front tibia, unless there are other hyster beetles that don't have flattened tibia on the middle and the hind legs, too. I don't know. Hi, friend. He makes me... History beetles make me laugh. They, they're small and angry and flat. Look how angry he looks. All right, so hyster beetles, a lot of hyster beetles are going to have this kind of oblong shape. Let's see if I can get him in real, really into focus. You know what? I know what I've got to do. I've got to turn him this way. I was getting better at getting guys into focus, but my beetles are all over the place today. We want the abdomen pointed towards the light so that I can show you where the elytra end. That's why I had to flip them around. Okay, now I think our beetle is mostly in focus, at least in focus enough for me to talk about him. This is a hyster 
beetle. All right, we will turn him sideways so that you can see how flat he is. Um, because with microscopy pictures, it's a little bit more difficult <clears throat> to show depth, right? Because the uh, focus is so narrow, the, the depth of field is so narrow. Now, hysterids, super flat beetles, all right? They do tend to have these really large mandibles, but that's not a characteristic because so many beetles have large mandibles that um, we're not really worried about that, okay? Um, if we look, so we've got the head, we have the thorax is here, the pronotum, right? Or the first segment of the thorax is up here, all right? The um, meso and the metathorax are back here and they are underneath the elytra, right? The elytra are those, that first pair of wings or that hard shell that all beetles have, we talked about in the beginning. This right here is the left elytra and this right here is the right elytra. You can kind of see that there's this line right here in the center that separates left and right. And then you can see this right here, this line and this line, that's the end of the elytra. All right, so it goes from here to here. And then, like I said, they're short, right? So you can see abdomen. This is the top side of its abdomen right here. All right, um, also, front tibia is super flat. Um, that's going to be a little bit more difficult to show you guys, but you can see that this is the tibia right here, the tarsi are coming out, and these kind of look like flattened, they almost look like shovels. Let's let you, let you look at this guy from the side. He isn't this flat because I squished him. He isn't this flat because I pinned him this way. They are this flat naturally, all right? They are very, very thin beetles. Um, and that's going to help them a lot when they are underneath bark, right? So if you pull bark out, these guys like to live underneath bark and they chew on all of the things. We love them. All right, so those are hister beetles. beetles. All right, the next beetle that we're going to be talking about are, oh, I wrote Taliads on here. I wrote Taliads on my list because I was so excited um, to show you them. And then I realized that my collection doesn't have them. So, it is my goal at some point within, I don't know, the next little bit, I wanna see if I can collect a Taliad. But these guys are called the feather wing beetles. And I love them because they have this really cool characteristic. They're, um, they're incredibly, incredibly small. Really, 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 really tiny, which is probably why I don't have any in my collection right at this very moment. I probably had them in alcohol and I don't have my alcohol collection anymore. All right. Mm. All right, I'm trying to draw this really fast. It's not uh, the best drawing in the world, but I think you'll understand. So, um, we have these beetles and they are called feather wing beetles because their hind wing literally look like feathers, all right? And they're really, really small, so these feathers that don't look like they would be super successful at flying, they are because they're so itty bitty tiny, they only have to fly from one little piece of dirt to another little piece of dirt. 
And so these beetles, they'll have, they're kind of round and circular. They have these hard elytra on the front, but their hind wings have this really cool bend. And then, let's see, the hind wings have this really cool bend. And then it's like a cool little puffy feather. And they're really, really fun to watch um, under the microscope alive fly around in the dish because you can look at it in the microscope and you'll see just like a pile of dirt, right? And then you'll have these little itty bitty beetles flying from place to place like they're flying over mountains. And it's an environment that you could just kind of like smash with your thumb. I don't know, I kind of love them. So uh, Talians get a special call out in the beetle live stream, even though I don't have any. <laughs> you know, these are the things that we do when we're entomologists. We, we, pick, we pick favorites and then, you know, unfortunately don't have any. All right, so um, the next family of beetles we're talking about are the sylphids. These are the carrion beetles. So these beetles like dead animals, all right? These beetles like, um, there are two different types of carrion beetles that we're gonna be looking at. We're gonna be looking at burying beetles and carrion beetles, but they are, let's see, in the same family. Get my history back where it belongs. All right, I'm gonna put both specimens of sylphids on the on the board together so that you can see both um, body forms. Now, they're in the same family, so they're grouped together, but they look significantly different. All right, so um, let's get characters down first. And so uh, we kind of want to, we when we're talking about sylphids, because there are two body forms, we actually have to talk about two kind of different sets of characteristics because we have, what, when I was learning these, I, we like to call the robust form versus the oval form. Seems to still work, so we're going to go with it. over. We're going to call in it and call it good. All right. Um, when we're talking about the robust form, they've got short antenna, kind of like those history beetles. You can see their, um, you can see their abdomen outside, um, past their elytra. Um, and let's see. You know what? I'm going to show you them. They're kind of difficult to explain. All right, this is a sylphid. This is a carrion. Burying beetle. Bloop. This is a burying beetle. All right, so I guess we could say... And then call it that burying. Is burying 1R? Maybe. All right. So um, if you want to call the sylphids broken down into two, you can actually probably break them down into the burying. And the carrion. Yeah, probably. OK. So these guys right here are the burying beetles. They are these black. They tend to have orange stripes on their elytra. Their elytra are these guys right here. This is one elytra on the left. This is the second elytra on the right. A lot of times you'll notice the pin goes through the right, the right elytra. That's where it's supposed to go. Um, one of the characteristics for this body form is that it has very square elytra, right? They're kind of they're squared off at the end and it shows one to three abdominal segments. So on this um, individual, it's showing all three abdominal segments. Sometimes the elytra is longer 
Um, but they all, all in this body form, will look pretty much exactly like this. There's not a lot of variety in um, in the colors as much as other beetles, right? You're not going to find like a bright green one. They're pretty much all black with um, a variety of orange decorations, right? So sometimes they're orange up here, sometimes they've got spots and stripes, um, but they're generally this black and orange color. And then you have these guys. These are also sylphids. They're in the same family. They look not a lot alike, right? Um, these guys are going to be, this is essentially the oval form, right? And the elytra are elongate on this, on this form, right? So the elytra actually go past the length of the abdomen. So you can see the elytra on the left here, the elytra on the right there, and it looks like the abdomen is, yeah, the abdomen ends way up here. These guys are short. So on this body form, they're very long and they have gradually clubbed antenna. All right, so that's gonna be another characteristic. And both of these, what these beetles have in common What these beetles have in common is that both of them, there. Um, what these beetles have in common is that both of them like dead bodies. All right, let's see. I'm gonna mess with my, I'm gonna mess with the exposure one more time. That's better. All right, so those are the sylphids. A lot of the characters, the characteristics for the sylphids are a little bit more difficult because they have those separate body forms, but also they're easier because if you see it, the, an insect that looks exactly like that, there's pretty much nothing else that looks like a burying beetle or a carrion beetle. So when you see them, you know what they are, which is kind of cool. All right, um, the next beetle we're gonna be looking at is a staphylinid. These are the rove beetles. When we are looking at the staphylinids or the rose rove beetles, the biggest characteristic, pretty much the only characteristic for every single individual in the family is that their elytra are very short. I mean, they look so short that it looks like they don't have wings and probably couldn't fly, except some of them can, um, which means it exposes most of the abdomen. All right. This is our rove beetle. If we are checking out, let's get it in the right direction so that it can be as much in the shot as possible. All right, we see the head up here. The thorax goes from about here to about here. And then we've got the abdomen. All right, if we zoom in to check out those elytra, those elytra start here and only go until about here. All right, this is the right side, this is the left side. You can see that it does have hind wings tucked and folded underneath the, um, underneath the elytra. You can see that on this specimen. Right there, right there. You can see a little bit of the wings that are tucked underneath. Now, rove beetles, you can see this abdomen. You can see the abdomen on the top. Most, I would say pretty much like maybe 90% of beetles, you can't see this much of the abdomen, right? Rove beetles, you can. A lot of times rove beetles will also run with their abdomen kind of curled up and over their body, almost like a scorpion. Sometimes the people are afraid of rove beetles because they kind of, um, 
because of the way that they hold their abdomens. But they don't sting, they don't bite, there's no real issue with them. Sometimes people find them in the house, and I'm not really even sure what they're looking for other than, like, um, they like to eat detritus, which is just dead plant material. first two trays of beetles there's so many to do it's already been an hour I think that it's definitely gonna take me more than 30 minutes to go through the rest of them so I think I'm gonna do is um, is finish this third little tray we're gonna go over the lucanids and the trogids trogdor no the trogid beetles um, and then we will talk about the scarabs and the click beetles and the longhorn beetles and the fungus beetles and the lightning bugs and the leaf beetles and the weevils. We'll talk about those on Thursday, all right? So we're going to push our schedule just a little bit. We'll talk about the minor orders next Monday. Um, and we can chat about the lucanids now. All right, so we're going to look at the Lucanids, which are the stag beetles. I have a handful of, of species of Lucanids. All right, when we're looking at the Lucanids, they have, there are some very, very specific characteristics for Lucanids. They have a 10-segmented comb-like antenna. All right, they, every Lucanid has the same number of segments on the antenna, so we'll be able to count those. All right, they also, that's gonna be, that's gonna be the, the pretty much the characteristic for all of them, males and females, right? But then, if you wanna talk about Lucanids, the stag beetles, the males will have um, large mandibles. So, let's see. Let's do this dude right here. Yeah. This is our Lucanid. This is our stag beetle or our Lucanid. You can see that it's male. It has these huge mandibles up in front. A lot of times people are scared of these guys. They're like, look at those huge mandibles. It's gonna bite me. And I'm gonna tell you, they definitely will bite you if you let them. Okay? Um, I, as a child, was trying to feed one something that it didn't eat. And it tried, and it definitely bit me. All right, so um, those lucanids are going to have those huge mandibles. Now they also have these comb-like antenna that you can kind of see off to the side here, but I'm going to flip the specimen upside down so that we can see the entire antenna and count the segments. gonna let you down come on bud he says no I'm gonna spin in circles I'm gonna have to find a better way to get these pins upside down Here. Ha. <clears throat> All right. So, we are counting 
counting in tunnel segments on our Lucanid. You can see that we call it a comb-like a comb-like antenna. So instead of it instead of it expanding on both sides or having um, an expansion on one side, a tooth on one side, and a tooth on the other, it's kind of like a single-sided tooth or a comb, right? We can count ten segments: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, <laughs> right? This whole thing right here, that's one individual segment. You can see there aren't any lines in between it. So that's gonna, that's gonna be our characteristics for all Lucanids. Hi, the dude, how you doing? Awesome, very good. Yep, 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 so all Lucanids on this planet are gonna have 10 antennal segments. Um, we can look at it on a smaller specimen with even cooler mouth parts, I think. So, this guy right here, this guy right here has ma mandibles that close in more than one spot. So you can see they're kind of toothed up here and they're toothed down. Um, up here and down there. Now, if we are looking at the antenna, the 10 segmented toothed and combed antenna right here, we're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Cool deal. So those are our Lucanids. Now, after the Lucanids, I wanted to talk about the Trogids. All right, so the Trogids are called also called skin beetles. They are a late stage um, rot beetle, I guess. So, hey, where'd my trogid stuff go? There they are. Okay. No. Strigity. Just trying to add this to my dictionary so that it stops underlining it red. All right, so we have our, very good, um, we have our trogid beetles, and these are going to be skin beetles. So these are beetles that actually will show up um, on a dead corpse, kind of after all of the wet stages, right? After the maggots have taken care of it, after the carrying beetles have taken like balls of flesh and buried it in the ground for their babies, the skin beetles show up and they numb on the, on the hide, right? They're gonna numb on like the, the, the fur and the meat and sometimes they'll numb on what's left of the bones. They like to hang out with dermestids, if you know what a dermestid is. These guys are really, really unique in their in the in the shaping of their exoskeletons. Let's see. So you can see they almost look like little rocks. All right, they have all of these really cool. Um, they have this really cool uh, bloop bloop bloop. What 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 would I call this? The uh, texture on their exoskeleton is very very rock like. And if you collect them, you'll notice that a lot of times they actually tuck their legs up into their body when they're scared, so they turn into what looks like a little rock. This also helps them when they are when they're kind of chewing on skin and hide, because that helps them. Um, they have this ability to to kind of hide with within, kind of like camouflage, right? All right, so we're gonna call it the dorsal surface, right? The top side is rough, or um, right, and then let's look. 
they're gonna have we're gonna look at we're gonna talk about what a ventrite is a ventrite is the the bottom side of the <laughs> he's scared oh um unfortunately this one is not scared some of his legs are out um uh, he's got five ventrites so we're gonna be looking on the underside of his body a ventrite is pretty much um is an abdominal segment on the bottom all right so we'll be have to flip them over and then we'll count the abdominal segments all right so he's got five of those and we're gonna have to look at the antenna he's got special antenna all right this is gonna be one of those times where I get to take the labels off of the specimen he's scared I wish he would sometimes that when they get scared they pull their legs and you'll almost see that his abdominal segment is also kind of like come on friend show off your butt there we go cool awesome so you can kind of see actually where his where his legs would kind of tuck in um when and if he got scared he even has this kind of odd shaped um pronotum and head so that he can kind of roll down into a ball um but if we look here this is gonna be our abdomen and we got five ventrites so we can count the segments one two three four you can see and i promise you there's a segment right here Sometimes they call call these a hidden segment, right? You can see that there's kind of this line right here. And that means that there's going to be another abdominal segment right here. The first one is kind of hidden. But I promise he has five. Very good. So five ventrites, and he's got that dor dorsal rough surface. Um, a lot of times those are the characteristics. Now, if we want to look at the antenna, there are some beetles that like to pretend to be trogons because being a trogon is so cool. So there are other beetles that are like, nah, I want to look like that. And those are some of the tenebrianids. And so you've got to be able to look at the antenna and the eyes to be able to identify to be able to confirm the identification and his man <laughs> he looks strong he is strong he has big expanded femurs and they are um and they their exoskeleton is super super thick so it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to pierce their exoskeleton All right, we're seeing the maxillary palps, but we are not seeing the antenna. So I saw right here, and I was hoping that those were going to be the start of the antenna, but those are what we like to lovingly call the mouth fingers. Let's see, I have one other trogon specimen, so we're going to see if we can see the antenna on the other friend. Get these labels back on really quick so there isn't too much of a gap. The <laughs> mouth fingers. Yeah, they're called them. Their um, their real scientific name are the maxillary palps. And I can show you that really quick. So, if you imagine, if you imagine being a bug, right? So you've got um a top lip up here, and then you have a bottom lip. All right, and then you have mandibles, and that seems to work just great right if you're a beetle you can walk around you can stick your face into the food and you can just chew 
but insects do one better. So they have, <laughs> yeah, you can imagine it, exactly. They've got these kind of like crazy maxillary pulps that they hang, that hang out right here um, next to the mandibles. And they'll take their labial pulps and they'll kind of push the food towards their mandibles. And that's what they're gonna use them for. All right. There's this really interesting thought process on like the evolution of insects and how they ended up with six legs. There's a thought that the maxillary pulpy actually used to be a set of legs. trying to see if we're going to be able to see this antenna before I put it on the screen. I think we are. Thank you! Any thoughts on the Asian lady beetle? Yes. So, the Asian lady beetle is one of those um, insects that is invasive, right? Native to, naturally native to China. Um, unfortunately, the lady beetle was an insect that we purposely released, uh, right? We did this to ourselves um, because the Asian lady beetle, we thought, was going to eat lots of aphids better than the ladybugs we have here. Um, and so with those guys, they are invasive. They do have an effect on the native populations. They tend to be super pests. Um, our native one seven spotted nine spotted were introduced all right so the asian ladybug um the asian lady beetle can have seven spots it can have nine spots it can be any colors from red orange yellow they have a variety of colors and a variety of numbers and so they are all lady beetles yes they are all in the family coccinellidae we actually hadn't gotten to the coccinellids yet um on the list, but I can show you. I can show you a native ladybug while we're while we're talking about them. Really quick, and this is just one example of a native ladybug. All right. Um, now let's see said, uh, native ones are seven, all of them lady beetles, I mean by name, common name. Okay, so, um, I think I know why you're asking. There's that meme going around. <laughs> There's that meme going around. Is that why you're asking me, uh, Pink? Um, so there's that meme going around that says ladybug or lady beetle, and then Asian lady beetle, and they try to separate them apart. Well, all ladybugs, all ladybugs are going to have, um, uh, where did my, my, yeah, all ladybugs are in the family coccinellidae, all right? They have the common name ladybug, ladybird, or lady beetle, um, but they all have that common name. Um, do these ones bite? Um, all ladybugs are gonna bite, unfortunately, because all ladybugs have chewing mouth parts. All right, so if you have, and they are all predatory. She does have a heart. I didn't notice that, dude. All right, um, yes, all ladybugs are gonna bite if you pick them up and bother them, um, but the ladybugs generally aren't aggressors. They don't kind of track you out. They don't try and find you to bite you. A lot of times it's like if it lands on you and you smack at it, it might bite you. Or if you are holding it in your hand and you're squeezing it, it can bite you. Um, I would say, I would say all ladybugs, because they have chewing mouth parts, have the ability to bite, but I think that, yeah, the Asian ladybug, the Asian lady beetle, is going to have more, is going to be biting people more commonly. Here's the thing, though. 
How frequently do you see native ladybugs, right? How often do you have the ability to interact and hold a ladybug, right? The Asian lady beetles are going to be biting people because they are living in the same space people are living, right? So if the Asian lady beetle moves into your house and you've got a bunch of them in the basement and they're coming out of their diapause or they're um, waking up from overwintering, right? Um, they're kind of groggy and then there's a giant in their lo it, where they're living and so they're trying to defend themselves, right? Um, if you saw native ladybugs in the same numbers, you would probably have the same number of bites. But the Asian ladybugs are significantly more common, invasive in fact, right? So you have tens of thousands of them and more human insect interactions. That's my guess. That's my theory, right? That's what I would put out in, the, that's what I would put out there into the world. I wouldn't say that naturally one are meaner than the other or more aggressive. I would just say that yeah, yeah, that's my hypothesis. That's what I would, that's what I would throw out into the world. Um, so, um, those are some capsinellids. Cool. You want to see some trogons? Or the trogon antenna? I was really close to getting there. They've got these wild looking antenna, which is their other characteristic. Dragon antenna, I wish. Up, 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 down, down, down. Come on, guys, where's the antenna? There they are. That is as close as I'm going to be able to get to the antenna. <clears throat> and if we are looking at our, if we're looking at these antenna, they do have that really, they have this really nifty club. They have a three segmented club here at the end. And you have, it almost looks like the first abdominal segment is kind of hairy in this species. That's kind of fun. I hadn't seen that before. Um, So, I don't know, this guy's kind of small. Do you see how this second um, antennal segment is significantly enlarged over the first and the rest of them? That's going to be the characteristic that we're going to be looking for. We're, we're, we're going to want to see that this second abdominal segment and sentence, blah, 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 sorry guys second antennal segment is going to um, kind of almost look like it even arises before the first one because it's kind of enlarged. Epilacony. It's funny. I hadn't. I hadn't really worked on. I hadn't really worked on the um, some of the subfamilies, and so you were talking about a specific subfamily of ladybugs. Beetles are a huge group. You are totally right. Beetles are the largest group of insects. They're huge. Um, so that's kind of one of the reasons why I love them. Um, I I would say that out of, let's put these trogons back, I think we're done with them. I think that I would say out of all of the insects that I have, my beetles are by far kind of the largest of, of my collection, but while you guys are here, you want to see a couple sphinx moths? Let's see, and some silk moths. These were all collected in Arizona this year. We haven't gone over the Lepidopteran in my live streams yet, so we're going to be going over them shortly. 
Um, but we've got these those sphinx moths up here, and these two silk moths, and this guy down here, the nododented. Kind of love them. Um, yeah. So the next family that we were going to talk about are the scarabs, scarabaeidae. The scarab beetles. If you want to talk about a huge group of insects, those are the scarab beetles, man. I would say there are so many subfamilies of them, okay? And so we're not going to talk about the subfamilies right now, although we really could. We could go into the dung beetles and the flower shapers and all of the other friends. Um, but kind of just want to show you them. So. Uh, oh yeah, and the rhinoceros beetles, right? Those are a type of scarab. So all scarab beetles, all scarab beetles have a um, clubbed antenna. And they'll have six ventrites. All right. So um, you remember those ventrites are the, when we count the abdominal segments up from the bottom. I have big guys, right? These are fairly these are fairly large scarabs. I say that guy right here. That's gonna be a, that's gonna be an ox beetle. Um, yes, it's gonna be an ox beetle. I don't have any of them. A lot of times, the major males of ox beetles will have huge horns. I've never collected a major um, a major male on these guys. I've only collected kind of the smaller ones, the littler horns. Um, there are a variety of, when you see a beetle that kind of has this body shape, you see these four up here on the top. There are some others thrown in down here, but they're all scarabs. These guys up here, though, are flower shavers. So they are a type of scarab. Um, they have a, they have a kind of that special body shape. We're going to look at them, but I, what I'm really going to is I want to show you the Chrysina. Have you guys seen Chrysina before? All right, I'll type it. Chrysina. These are called the jewel scarabs. All right, the Chrysina are my favorite genus of, um, they're my favorite genus of scarabs. There are four species of Chrysina in the United States, and I collected the final species this year, this summer on my collecting trip, so I was pretty stoked. All right, these guys are Chrysina, and they are metallic green scarabs. I love these guys up here on the top that are, we're gonna, we're gonna look at some of these guys under the microscope, super cool. So this one, yes, see, I agree. They're absolutely gorgeous. This is what we call Chrysina Gloriosa, or, or the glorious jewel scarab. All right, I think that, I don't know, I don't know if I have a favorite Chrysina, but this one is absolutely gorgeous. I think it was the first Chrysina that I collected, so that definitely holds a special place in my heart. Um, these guys over here, let's see, we'll go with this one. This is also, you can see this jeweling, this jeweling or metallic green also on this specimen, um, but it doesn't have those silver stripes, right? So this is going to be a different species. This guy, if we look on his side, you see that's where he's pretty. He's got those really kind of gorgeous coppery toned legs. Let's see. I should just learn to put it on a styrofoam so that you guys can see it and I don't shake it while I hold it. All right, so this is Chrysina lacantii. It has kind of these metallic or kind of coppery legs. All right, that was the species that I hadn't collected yet. 
So it was the last one I collected up at Wing Mountain in Arizona. Um, these guys are Chrysina Bayeri, and the characteristic on them is they're also beautiful and green and metallic, except they have metallic purple legs. <laughs> All right. Um, that's the characteristic for this species, and it can only be found in Arizona and New Mexico. And then down in Arizona and New Mexico, and then down into Mexico. All right, so purple legs. And then the last one is actually the most difficult to find. It's generally the last one that people collect. It's called Chrysina wood eye. And it's also that beautiful, really awesome metallic green coloration, except it has metallic blue tarsi. All right, it has metallic blue feet. And when you put these specimens into alcohol, the alcohol metallics blue. Um, it's kind of wild. You, it messes with the it messes with the alcohol, and everything kind of shines blue. Now, these colors are never going to fade, all right? They're called structural colors. So um, the colors are actually formed by small crystalline shapes on the exoskeleton that help them become metallic and um, help them get the color. Now, if, um, if they die, that color is never going to fade. On insects like grasshoppers and crickets and praying mantids and dragonflies, all of those insects have um, have pigmented colors, and pigments fade over time. All right, and so um, a lot of times, beautiful green grasshoppers or really pretty red legs or blue bodies on dragonflies, all of those fade away eventually because they're pigments. Um, whereas a lot of beetles get to stay the color because they're structural. All right. Have you seen lamellate antenna? So this is a 10-lined June beetle, and it has what we call, um, uh, this is a 10-lined June beetle, and it has these what we call lamellate antenna, and those have the ability to open and close and help them sense around. All right, I think that we should get to, so I promise, so they've got these clubbed antenna. Now, these are actually lamellate antenna, and you're saying, hey, Trisha, I thought you said all scarabs have clubbed antenna. Well, um, the last antenna, the last group of antenna segments is going to form a club, and if you took all of those antenna segments and you smashed them together, they do kind of look like a club, except this specimen died kind of with it open. All right, so um, he's a little bit, he breaks the rules a little bit, but if you can see the specimen next to him, let's see, the specimen next to him has them enclosed, and you can kind of see, there we go. And so you can kind of see that those look like, they kind of look like clubs at the end, and then if we flip them over, he's going to have, oh, there's Fluff. Go away, Fluff. We don't need you. He's going to have six ventrates. Stay. Stay. All right. If we're counting ventrates, we count. Oh, hey. That's the wrong page. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, and then the one under the legs, six. Um, we had to count that on the trogid or on the lucanids too, right? So if you're counting, one, two, three, four, five, and then you kind of have to refocus a little bit. You see that there's this break in this segment. The legs connect up here, so there's another abdominal segment that's kind of hidden by the legs, and that's six. Do you guys?
guys have um do you guys have a favorite type of beetle? Yep. And yes, I did look up Apalachini, um, which are a subfamily of Coccinellids. Um and I thought that most coccinellids were predatory. I'd have to look into that. I have... N From everything that I've read and understood, most to all ladybugs are predatory and not herbivorous. Um... I would have to look into, I would have to look into that. Cool. All right. Now, there is the difference between jewel scarabs and jewel beetles. All right. So the next family we're going to do are jewel beetles. There are, there are a different family. All right. So buprestids are their own family of beetles, and they tend to be beautiful metallic colors. Um, if you've ever seen, if you've ever seen um, earrings and jewelry made out of beetle elytra, that is most of the time jewel beetles. All right. Um, in really pretty tropical areas, jewel beetles, they'll, um, the natives will actually rip the elytra, the front pair of wings, off of these beetles and they'll put them on necklaces and use them for jewelry. Um, now the ones that I have aren't particularly beautiful and colorful when you're looking at them outside of the microscope, but once you can start looking at them under the microscope, you'll see all their kind of, all of their metallics. All right, and outside of just having beautiful colors, because that can't be a characteristic that you use all the time, um, they're going to have... <sighs> Sorry, I gotta crack my neck a little bit. Um, we, we're gonna call it a... We're gonna call it a prosternal hinge. Sternum. Yeah. All right, we're going to call it a prosternum hinge, but we're going to look at it really quick. It's obvious to see kind of an odd word. Doop, doop, doop. Doop, 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 doop. There we go. So we are looking on the underside of this beetle. There we go. Right there. So um, the pronotum is the first segment of the thorax, right? I think I've, I've mentioned the pronotum a couple times now. So we've got the head. The first segment is generally called the pronotum, right? Um, but on the underside, we're gonna call it a prosternum, all right? Because um, this is kind of the sternal side or the chest side, the bottom side, all right? And it's got this hinge. You see it that crumb comes down and goes back up. All jewel beetles are going to have this kind of projection right here behind their head that goes between their legs. But I would say 90% of the time when I see a jewel beetle, I look and I see its body shape um, being kind of like a, I guess it's kind of missile-like. And then they tend to be kind of metallic. Come on, friend. Be a little bit metallic for me. We're going to go to the other specimen and see if it's a little bit better for you. And if not, I 
I've got a book behind me that I can show you some pretty ones. Maybe I only collected the boring ones. So far. Yeah, he's not too metallic. Okay. These are wood boring beetles. So as immatures, they spend their time as grubs, um, actually under bark in trees. All right, unfortunately mine weren't super, super pretty and metallic. So I wanted to show you this friend. He is a really awesome, pretty specimen of jewel beetles. Now, um, You've got, there's this really cool book, Field Guide to Jewel Beetles on the East Coast. Um, actually, it's funny, Canada was giving them away for free. You just had to call the Canadian government and ask them to mail you a copy of this book. And they did. Which is kind of cool. Alright, so, I was trying to find some really kind of pretty ones to show you. And I don't know, so... A lot of these, I guess a lot of them are kind of dark, but they have this metallic sheen a lot of times. So it'll look dark, but then it'll kind of be like a metallic red or a metallic green. Yay for free books! I agree. I think it's the best thing when you can call Canada and be like, send me a book, please. Or this one. It's metallic blue. And, um... And even though it was free from Canada, it has the geographic region for the eastern United States. So if you live east of the Mississippi, this is a great book to have for jewel beetles. Okay. Digital copy. Is there a digital copy of it? I'm not sure. So I guess you can look it up. It's called... The Field Guide to the Jewel Beetles, and there's a bunch of art authors on it, but the first one is Stephen M. Payero. There you go. Stephen Marshall writes a lot of bug books, so they must have gotten his opinions when they were getting it. Maybe even some pictures. I'm not sure if they have a digital copy. I would have to look into it. Okay. Jewel beetles. Click beetles. Oh my goodness. How many of you out there have played with click beetles? I spent so much, excuse me, I spent so much of my childhood flipping poor click beetles over. Oh man. So if you've never... <coughs> Yes. Awesome, TJ. Yeah. Did you find it? There you go. Awesome. So that is the full digital PDF. So you don't even have to have Canada mail you one. Thank you for finding that. Pick a big click beetle so the characteristic is big. How about that? Now, the click beetles. The click beetles, we are. I think those were click beetles. They also lit up around the head two little green dots. sure what you mean TJ do you mean that you think that the last that the last two specimens were click beetles um the last two specimens were called jewel beetles so they're called buprestids um our click beetles are very oh okay <gasps> yes Click beetles light up. Got 
Lucia. It took me a minute to it took me a minute to follow through. Um, there are species of click beetles that light up. Um, they glow, and you're right, they glow. They have two little green dots up near the head. Um, it's actually right there on the pronotum or the shield that kind of guards the head. And um, they, right, they still click. So if you put them upside down, they still pop and flip over, but they're nocturnal. So they're flying around at nighttime and they glow like fireflies. Those are so cool. I'm jealous. I didn't get to play with those when I was a kid. Um, the first time I saw those was probably just two or three years ago. So, oh, maybe it was a little longer than that now. It's probably, probably four or five years ago. We lost 2020 and, and the years went to who knows where. Um, so yeah, about four or five years ago when I was in Texas, Texas? Yes, I was in Texas. I was in Boy Scout Canyon and I had a black light set up and I started hearing all of these like really kind of scary pot belly pig kind of noises. Um, and I was out in the wild by myself and so I wasn't really super comfortable. So I was starting to just set down. So I turned off the light because I was like, I don't want to be so close to these uh, large animals out there in the wild. And um, I turned off the light and then all of the click beetles from the sheet that were collected that were kind of there they started to light up and they started to fly around. And I was like, that's so cool. All right, so yes, those exist. There are also, I'm gonna go on a mini tangent because um, I like them and I like that you guys are chatting with me about books. So um, there is a uh, there is a cockroach called the glow spot roach, all right? And they're found in South America, um, northern countries of South America. So like Ecuador and Venezuela and the northern part of Brazil, that area. Um, you can find these things called glow spot roaches. And glow spot roaches will glow at the same frequency as the click beetles that glow. Well, the click beetles that glow are actually toxic. They're poisonous. So don't eat them, by the way, um, they're no good for you. And so the roaches will mimic that coloration or those or that those two glowing spots to protect themselves from predators. And it's one of the very few examples that we have of light being used as a way to confuse predators, you know? Whereas camouflage happens a lot, right? You can just blend into your surroundings. This is like, hey, I'm glowing and I'm poisonous so you can't eat me and these are a species of glow spot roaches well over the course of time and actually actually unfortunately through light pollution the um the predators are actually as as civilization closes in on the rainforest in those areas um the predators can tell the difference between the click beetles and the roaches and so the roaches are actually going extinct. There's a lot, many of them that are endangered and one species that hasn't even been seen since like the thirties um, because of light pollution. And unfortunately that species that we haven't found um, in like, what, a almost a hundred years now, um, there was a catastrophic volcanic eruption that happened in the only place they were ever collected. So that volcanic eruption may have wiped out the species we haven't seen them since, so we're not sure. But they're in the depths of the jungle. All right, that's my uh, that's my random story. We're talking about click beetles. Now, for those of you who haven't played with click beetles in your past, um, click beetles will if they lay on their if you lay them on their backs they have the ability to click their head and flip themselves over so that they're back on their feet so they never get caught on their back and all click beetles are going to have this <laughs> all right this is their hinge um this is their hinge and and it's how they and it's how they click so you'll see, you'll always, in click beetles, you'll always find this kind of pokey, um, this pointed projection um, from the base of the head, 
right? So we're looking at here, this is the bottom side of the head. We see some antenna. There's some finger, um, mouth fingers out there. <laughs> Not Lucy Hormetica varicosa. Um, varicosa is a glow spot roach that is in the pet trade. Um, Lucy Hormetica is the genus. I believe there is something like 12 or 13 species of Lucy Hormetica. Three of them are in the pet trade. Um, and the others are still wild. Yep, yep, yep. So that's going to be our characteristic for click beetles. It's not one that's super complicated, so there's not a lot to say about it. Um, you can see the groove. You can see the pointy part. Yes, of that genus. All right. So I guess we can say the elaterids or the click beetles have a... Um, Hinged pronotum. We're gonna call it that. But you guys saw it. It was that. It was that spine, and then the um, and then the divot. We could look at it on a variety of specimens. I'm gonna say, um, when I was a kid, I loved to collect an insects and play with them and use and pl and pretend they were my pets, you know, and, and try and feed them. And I'm gonna tell you, I had. It's not this specimen. But I had an eastern-eyed click beetle right up here that um, that I had kept in a container and fed and loved pretty much all summer long. I kept it alive for four or five months, and I was pretty proud of myself as a little child. So I always like I always like finding the um, I always like finding the eastern-eyed click beetles, um, and so we might as well look at the hinge on this guy too before we put him away. Just to give you an idea of what it might look like or what um, how it might change based on species. So on this specimen, the legs are a little bit in the way, but you can see that this projection comes down here and you can see on the other side, you can see this notch. Beetle flies. I don't know if I've really heard of them. What's the family on that? Do you know what the family is for a beetle fly? I've already done my fly live, my Diptera live stream, and I don't have any of those. Oh, cool. Whoa. Those are wild. I've never seen those before. I want one. What? All right, I'm a little jealous. I've never seen those before. Um, so I'll have to I'll have to look into that. They look kind of small, so it might kind of be it might be a little bit more difficult to collect them. I wonder how I wonder if you find them sweeping or if you can set a trap for them. I'm a fan of setting traps for bugs so that I can kind of leave it and come back. Um, sometimes when I'm doing, I road trip across the country. Um, this summer I drove from Philadelphia up to Lansing, Michigan, and then down to Arizona and then back. Um, and I set up traps along the way in places that people won't find, like in like, uh, parks and stuff, parks and forests and places that are off the beaten path. And then on my way back, I'll pick up my traps. Um, and it's kind of a fun way to collect because those traps are out for a week or two weeks while you're out and about, and then you can come back and collect what you have. Um, kind of fun. So I wonder if there's a way to, I wonder if there's a way to trap for them. 
Lysids! These are going to be the net winged beetles. A lot of time net winged beetles are, <clears throat> are orange and black. Um, a variety of like in between those colors. A lot of times they're mostly orange with either black stripes or black spots or black um, modeling. Uh, Lysons are just like that. Um, let's see, they have like a forward facing head, which also is kind of funny. So my adult entomology professor, um, I went to Michigan State. So when I was in when I was in school, they used I had a professor that loved to say the gushtalt. You've got to know the gushtalt, or you've got to like connect with your gushtalt. And I don't know if he was e ever even using the term correctly, but what he meant was that a lot of times when you are when you're like learning to identify insects, you just kind of have to look at enough of them to know what characteristics you're looking for and where they belong in, in, in the group, right? So this guy, <coughs> this is a net winged beetle. A lot of times they're going to have um, softer elytra. So instead of having um, those really, really solid, hard exoskeleton like you see in scarabs and all of the beetles, pretty much all of the beetles we've seen so far had very, very hard exoskeletons. These guys are, are kind of soft. They have that kind of softer elytra. They have, they have some characteristics even on their elytra. They almost look like their elytra have veins or nets, net wings, right? So it almost looks like their elytra have veins, but they don't, those aren't, I don't think that those are considered veins. Anyway, um, then you can see that he's orange and he's got those black tips on his elytra, those black tips on his wings. And that's, honestly, that's going to be one of the big characters for these guys. So if we look at a different species, if we look at a different species, still a net winged beetle. Still a net winged beetle. Right? So it still has that orange, it has the black tips on the elytra. If we zoom in really close, we can see that he's got those kind of net um, shapings on the, um, on the outside of his exoskeleton, right? He's got this kind of patterning. And a lot of times, and a lot of times if you look at the elytra, at the edges, they are not parallel. Right? These guys kind of expand past the side of the abdomen. Right? So their elytra are expansive. They don't run parallel to each other. You can see they kind of come out a little bit. That's going to be a big characteristic because the soldier beetles are going to look very similar except that their elytra are going to be parallel to each other. <clears throat> All right, so we've got the Lysids. Uh, we can say that they just kind of have, we're gonna say that they've got nets on the elytra, right? So it looks like almost that they have those um, net veins. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but I can show it to you. I laugh at myself. Alrighty, so we had <clears throat> we had those net wing beetles, and I want to show you a soldier beetle really quick. These are in the family Cantharidae. And their sides, the sides of their elytra are gonna be pretty much parallel. Like arguably arguably exactly parallel and they have their head is visible from above so when you're looking at them you can see the head and it's not covered by the pronotum a lot of times beetles their heads are going to be a little bit back and their pronotum goes above their head to kind of cover and protect their head with soldier beetles they don't feel the need to protect their heads All right. Oh 
and put it this way so we can get the whole thing in the mic in the camera all right this is going to be our soldier beetle all right so you can see that it has very similar characteristic to the netwing beetles if we do look very closely at the elytra you're going to see there is some patterning you're going to see there is some patterning but it's not net winged like the net winged beetles were um you'll notice that you can see the head from above right this is the pronotum back here and the head you can see obviously and the sides of the elytra right here and right here are parallel and i would say 90 percent of soldier beetles look pretty much like this um Sometimes there's huge variation in families of beetles, and sometimes a lot of them look the same. This lid is one of those that looks generally the same most of the time. Yay. Yeah, so right now we're pretty much going through a number of families that have those softer elytra. Um, so those net wing beetles, they're not, if you squish them, they don't really crunch. All right. I would argue that they're elytra are closer to tegmina like they're closer to um the texture of a grasshopper's wing instead of a beetle's wing you know you guys are gonna know what this one is i'm gonna show it to you before you before i tell you you guys know what this is This is a Lampyridae. I don't. They are lightning bugs. Or fireflies. Or however you would like. There are two common names for these guys a lot of times. They're either called lightning bugs or fireflies. Um, these are the ones that fly around and light up. Right? So we were talking a little bit earlier with our um, with our Twitch friends that they had the elytra or the, um, the elytrids, the click beetles that glowed, that glowed in, at night, right? Well, lightning bugs do the same thing. You might be surprised that not all lightning bugs glow. There are some day flying lightning bugs that don't have glowing organs, but let's see. We're going to say that the abdomen has luminescent organs because most of them do and we'll be able to see it on this specimen I spelled luminescent wrong and then <clears throat> they have we're gonna say that their head is hidden from above so their pronotum if you look at this right here this little piece this is actually the pronotum this is not the head you can't see the head from above, all right? This is the first segment of the thorax. If we flip our insect upside down, If we flip our insects upside down, we can see the head. It's right here. All right? You can see the eyes, the antenna, the little itty bitty mouth parts, and fireflies are a really, really cool family of beetles. All right? They do have the ability to glow. We can check out its glowing organ right here. You can see the last handful of segments on its abdomen are this yellow color. This is where the chemical reaction is going to occur that allows them to glow. All right, now let's do lightning bug story time. Lightning bug story time. All right, lightning bugs are fun for a handful of reasons. One, because they are predatory. All right, they hunt and eat other insects. A lot of times people think that um, lightning bugs are herbivorous and that they're going to be eating a lot of grass and a lot of leaves, um, but lightning bugs a lot of times are predatory and they feed on very, very small insects like mites and 
little things that they can collect around in the ground, right? Now, lightning bugs also communicate via light flashes. I'm sure you guys know this. You see them flashing at nighttime, right? Blink, 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 blink. The males, the boys, are the ones that have to fly around. And when you see a lightning bug flying and flashing, it's a guy, all right? The ladies are lazy, and they sit on the ground, and they flash their, their lamp from the ground, all right? And so the idea is that the males are flying through the air flashing, and they're looking for ladies, and the ladies stay stationary, and they just blink, and they wait for a guy to come down to them, all right? And then they can mate, and they lay eggs, and they do all the wonderful things. Except that some female ladybugs have gotten really, really uh, inventive. They've become inventive, all right? Because there are some species, there are some species of female lightning bugs that instead of um, flashing their own flash pattern so that individuals from their species know who they are, there are lightning bugs that will flash the flash patterns of different species. All right, so they'll just kind of mimic another species flash pattern. And then when the male is like, oh, I found someone of my species and I'm so excited and I'm gonna fly down here and I'm gonna mate and it's gonna be cool. And then the lady is the wrong species and he's like, what? And before he can get away, she's eating him. All right, so there are some female lightning bugs that will actually eat other lightning bugs. Um, different species, right? They'll attract other males, and then they nom them. I love it. It's like the random stories that you can tell at parties that people would be kind of, like, surprised at. Those are the stories that I love about bugs. Like, the ones that'll startle you. I'll be like, wait, they do what? Cool. Lightning bugs. <laughs> All right. Don't drop the specimen. Ugh. Okay. The next guy. I think you all are going to like this one. was collected in Arizona. <laughs> you can even see it in the back. Um, this, collect this specimen was collected in Real Rico, Arizona, and it is a trogocytid. Um, also called a bark gnawing beetle. I want to know what's up with all of these gorgeous beetles spending their time underneath wood so that I can't find them. It's probably for exactly that reason, guys. Alright, so trogocytids are one of those interesting families where there are also two, um, two body forms, alright? This is the first body form that I would call the cylindrical one. So you can see that its body is kind of narrow and parallel along, along the side. And it's going, they're always going to have, they're always going to have a narrow waist. Um, they're always going to be, when I kind of see them, I think that they're kind of cigar shaped. So I guess that's what I'm going to call them. They are round and they kind of have flat ends on each, each side and they have a narrow waist. Those are trogocytids. This is a particularly beautiful one because it's metallic green and blue. I'm going to tell you, most of the, my favorite insects that I've collected, I've collected them in Arizona. All right. And then there is a second body form that I don't have with me, and that is going to be kind of like a more oval body shape. 
and um, I don't have an example of that one, so I'm not going to be able to show you it. Uh, but I guess if you were going to kind of imagine a shape, I would imagine something that looked like the carrion beetle's oval body shape, but very small. If that makes sense. Yep, so I guess it is the bark gnawing beetles. <laughs> Yay! Alright. This has been going on for two hours, guys. I'm pretty excited about it. There's so many families of beetles, though, it's hard to get through them all, and I really just wanted to go through them. Aww. Alright, what do you think? Do we do the even, even, really, really small families? You guys want to see the little itty bitty ones that are double pointed so that they they this specimen i'll give you i'll give you a kind of a, a view up here so that you can see don't drop it this specimen is double pointed so if this family of beetles is actually so small that the small pin um, is too big for it. So you pin a piece of styrofoam to the pin and then you use an even smaller mounting pin to, um, to pin the actual beetle. He's so pretty though. Okay, I'll show you him. He's just so small. This is a Malirid. Um, and I'm, he is, he's so tiny. Um, this is a Malirid, and I'm going to Google the common name. I don't remember. The soft-winged flower beetles. Probably why I don't remember. It's a long name. to you that I identified this Malirid a long time ago. Let's see. Back in uh, it's a decade ago. Back in 2011 I identified this beetle um, and I haven't gotten another one since and so I don't have I don't have the characteristics to share with you on this guy. They eat pollen and insect eggs. Hmm. All right. Well, he has these really beautiful metallic blue spots on his elytra, which is really why I wanted to show you him. And we can check him out a little bit. He has, let's see, he has that waist in between his pronotum and his elytra. Let's look, let's look at his face. very very small insects is that you only move them a little itty bitty bit and they're already gone out of the microscope and it's funny because if I focus the microscope on what I can see my eyes focus a little bit differently than the microscope so I have to focus a little bit above what I can see those are some wild looking antenna. So if you look, the antenna are right here and they connect at the base and these are not broken off. Um, they're just kind of short and stubby little antenna. Um, his head does um, come out from underneath his pronotum, right? So you can see his head from above. He's got all of these really cool hairs all over his elytra. So if I scare, scroll back, you can see the hairs along the body. Those are called CD. I would say the biggest characteristic for these guys is that they're super, super small. <laughs> and I wish a 
And maybe the next time I do, when I'm going through the families, I will find the characteristics for this guy. Because he was, um, he's rare enough that I actually, I didn't prep for him. Whoops. He's just existed, so I wanted to show you him. This. This is pleasing. I'm making little jokes to myself. Right here, this guy. This is a pleasing fungus beetle. It's in the family. I'm gonna scroll down a little bit. This is a pleasing fungus beetle. It is in the family Erotility. Erotility. That is correct. That is correct. All right, we are looking at the Erotility. Um, on the Erotilids, one of their big characteristics is that they have a three-segmented clump. So you can see right about, you can see right about here, they've got this club on the end of their antenna that is one, two, three segments long. All right. And then if we're going to have to look at the front coxy, so we're going to have to flip this guy upside down. The front coxy um, is doop, 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 rounded. Ha. Thanks for that. So pleasing fungus beetles, this beetle used to be blue. <laughs> All right, so unfortunately the blue on my pleasing fungus beetle was a pigmented color and it no longer exists. <laughs> um, this specimen was collected in, oh no. There's not a date. I'm gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna have to look into when this guy was collected so that I can put a date on the specimen. I've only been to May's Tropical Museum one time and if I collected it there, I should be able to look at through pictures and figure out the date that I was there. At least there's a solution to the problem. Cool. All right, this is the front pair of legs. It, when we are talking about the coxy of, um, when we're talking about the coxy, that's essentially the hip bone on an insect leg. All right, it's where the leg connects to the body. This right here is the coxy. Right here, so you can see this is the leg. Um, these are the tarsi or the little toes. Um, this is the the uh, tibia. Um, connected to the tibia, you have the femur. And then the femur is connected to the coxy. Kind of like uh, the hip bone's connected to the, <laughs> you know, femur bone. I don't know if that's a thing. Femur, tibia. I love that. I love that insects and humans both have femurs and tibias. And they're in the right direction, so we remember what they are. Now, pleasing fungus beetles. All pleasing fungus beetles have these coxi that are rounded, that are circular like these, and that's going to be characteristic for the family. Um, there are many different types of pleasing fung fungus beetles, and they ha can be a variety of different really gorgeous colors. This one that used to be bright blue that is now kind of like this tan green color, um, is just one example 
of these beetles. Hey, guess what? We made it. We made it to the coccinellids. Some of you guys have been with me since we started, since we went off on a little tangent about um, the coccinellid beetles. Or the ladybugs. Oh man, my hair's getting all wild. So, <clears throat> TJ wants to know if I've ever collected in Central Florida because of the numbers of awesome large insects and parks across the state. Unfortunately, I, I don't think I've done any collecting in Florida. No, I haven't been to Florida since I was um, very young. So actually, that should be a place to go on, that should be a place on my list of places to go. You know, the la I think the last time I was in Florida was for uh, Disney when I was like 10. And I didn't collect any specimens back then um, in Florida. So, no, but I would love to go. Do you have any parks that you would recommend? I'm checking on the spelling of coccinellidae, and there are two L's in it, and that's why it's yelling at me. Alrighty. Now, um, a lot of times, the ladybugs... <laughs> yeah? Where would you collect? So, a lot of times when you're talking about collecting in states, there are regulations on kind of where you can collect, and it's by state most of the time. So, in Michigan, um, which is where I grew up, you are allowed to collect... Um, you're allowed to collect in um, recreation areas, but you are not allowed to collect in state parks. Oh, that'll be cool. Thank you. Um, and if you're on my Instagram, if you want, you can play Guess That Bug every day. <laughs> Monday through Friday, I post three pictures um, on Instagram. Generally, it's 10 a.m., it's 10, 2, and 5. Um, and the first picture that comes out at 10 is a super, super zoomed in picture of an insect in my collection. Um, and then at 2, I put together, um, at 2, there's a second picture, but it's probably a little further out. And it's of like a characteristic of the family or of the species. Um, and then at 5, I give everybody the answer of what it was. Um, and so I play both of those. I play that on both... Um, um, Instagram and Facebook. Do you want to find me there? Those places. All right, ladybugs are. We can call them dorsally convex. Right? If you see a ladybug, you know that it is roundy on the top. All right, that's what I mean by dorsally convex. Always liked insects, but never studied them. All right, here's a couple of thoughts. It depends on where, what you're trying to really get into. Now, um, when I started with insects, I started with a handful of good field guides. Let's see. Oh, I don't have my field guides here. All right, so I'll give you two things. This is an old, 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 let's start with all the basics. Awesome. So this is a super, super old book, all right? There is many more editions, so I would get a newer edition because the third edition is very wrong. There are lots of things that have changed since this one came out. But 
Um, it's called An Introduction to the Study of Insects. It's generally the first book an entomologist purchases in school for classes. Um, they call them, <laughs> their last names are Borer and DeLong, and um, people who don't love insects say that the book is boring and DeLong, and that makes me a little sad, but um, because, like, there aren't a lot of pictures, all right? So this one, this one would be your basics as you are kind of, like, learning about insects and about, um, and about anatomy. It breaks down every piece of the insect's head. Um, actually, my favorite diagram, one of my favorite diagrams of the wing is actually in this book. Um, there. Wing venation. I, I, there's a part of me that I just love wing venation. And so there's a, there's a system to naming them and numbering them, the veins and the cells. And it talks about all of that. Um, and then it goes into every single order of insects. All right. So this, for instance, is a cicadelity. All right. This is a leafhopper. Um, and it shows the body and all of the wing venations. And this guy, it also has keys. All right. So as an entomologist or as somebody who's just learning bugs, you're going to be working with a lot of these crazy dichotomous keys. And this book has keys to every family. Pretty much, I think every family of insects is in this book. Um, not this one because it's an old one, but if you get the newer version, uh, there are no color pictures. They are all line drawings. Um, but bang for your buck, I would suggest this one first. Um, it's the first one I read. I read it in high school. Um, now if you're looking for pictures, If you're looking for pictures, um, Insects, A Natural History by um, Stephen Marshall. All right. This is, they call it the Bug Bible. All right. This thing is huge. And let's see. Find a fun picture for you. I don't know. They're all fun. Let's look at these guys. These are the longhorn beetles. We're about to go and get into my longhorn beetles in a little bit. So we might as well see these guys. So this is what this book looks like, a lot of it. It's got um, pictures, color photographs. Let's see if I can get this right. Um, yep, there we go. It's got color photographs of pretty much every, I think of every family of insects. So you got beetles, you've got cool flies. Um, I wonder if solifids are in here. We're gonna look up, we're gonna look up those beetle flies. Because I'm surprised I've never seen them before and I want to know if they're in this book. They are not. Guys, that's the sad. So, the solipids are not in this book. I wonder if they're in the Boer and DeLong book. No problem. I'm a bookaholic for bug books, so I have a lot of them. I could go on. We could talk about like specific insects, like the jewel beetle book that we talked about earlier. There's actually a link to that PDF above. Um, that one is really good, beautiful pictures. Actually, a really good key too um, to all the bupressids. There is an available PDF for um, it's a hymenopteran. It's a bees, wasps, and ants book. And I think it's like 500 pages that's available for free online. And it's a key to, I think, every genus in Hymenoptera. That sounds like a lot to me, at least a family. 
I used it a lot for the, the micro hymenopterans, so the, the very, very small parasitoids. Yeah, and then if you want to do aquatics, we'll do one more. Depends on if you're going terrestrial or aquatic too, because this book, um, An Introduction to the Aquatic Insects of North America, it is by um, Rich Merritt, Ken Cummins, and Marty Berg. Um, they are the coolest people that you'll ever meet. I swear. Oh. Sorry. Let me know when you come back. <clears throat> I hope their things are less laggy. Is anybody else having problems with lag? My frame rate, rate may have just dropped. I don't know how to fix that. Yeah, no problem. Is it all better? I think my frame rate may have dropped too. I don't know what happened. All right, so one more. Wanted to share the aquatics book. Um, if you are doing aquatic insects, so if you are going out into rivers and streams and lakes and collecting there, this book is the one you want. It's Aquatic Insects of North America by Rich Merritt, Ken Cummins, and Marty Berg. Three of the pretty much coolest entomologists out there. They're great. <laughs> kind of. And this keys a lot of things out to genera, but definitely down to family. And I would say some of the some of the line drawings in this book are absolutely gorgeous. I would say I kind of I, I love the drawings in this book. So that's the idea. Okay. Yay. So you guys want to know crazy story? Oh no. What do I, how do I fix the lag? I don't know what I fix. I'm just kind of sad about that. Um, if, did the, the lag just started though, right? to fix I want to fix it for you guys so I'm going to try and figure it out um a lower frame rate what about uh the video bit rate what if I lowered that
that change anything? on my side <clears throat> all right so we're still good in that in that sense and we can still flip to the microscope hopefully and see great perfect thank you for letting me know that story while I have a handful of you guys watching and interacting with me um I am gonna be in a documentary I'm gonna be in a movie <laughs> it's coming out on Amazon in January at some point and it's four parts it's called bug out <clears throat> and it's about the above and underground bug trade all right so it's going to be a pretty cool, It's gonna, I think it's going to be pretty cool. They aren't letting us see it before it releases, so that's going to be interesting. Um, but yeah, you guys can totally look out for it. Um, it's kind of fun. All right, I look back on. This is our native ladybug. All right, we looked at it a little bit earlier, but we looked at it from the top. So we know that it looks like ladybug, right? It's dorsally convex, meaning that it has that, that convex body shape. It's rounded on the top. All right, um, we're gonna be looking really closely at the eyes up here on the front. They're notched by the antenna. Um, he's so small. If we are looking at, we're looking at, this is the compound eye down here. This is where the antenna comes out. I wish my microscope zoomed in a little further so that you could see this. But right where this, right where this antenna is coming out, right about here, there's going to be a notch in the, there's a notch in the eye. So it's not a perfectly circular eye. There's, it's gonna be shaped like this, and then it comes around, and it there's this notch right about like this, play with the light a little bit, see if that helps. Um, ladybugs are also going to have a ladybugs are also gonna have very short antenna. So if you look right about. Right about here, man, he's not as good. Ladybugs have incredibly, incredibly short antenna. So if you were going to be looking and then it goes right about here and then this is a little club. So it expands at the end of the antenna. So all ladybugs are gonna have clubbed antenna. They're gonna have these notched eyes. They're gonna be kind of dorsally convex. They're gonna be kind of roundy. So 
Abrianids are also going to have notched eyes, which is why I want to get to them really quick so that you can see what a notched eye looks like. Oh no! My beetle is being eaten. All right, the next family outside of ladybugs is going to be the tenebrionids. There is a very common species of tenebrionids. The mealworms. If you go to the store and you buy mealworms from the store, those are immature darkling beetles. All right, so those are going to pupate, they become adults, and they grow up into tenebs. Is it getting laggy again? Dude? Uh, from my side, it says that it's green, so I don't know. Um, So we're going to be looking at the darkling beetles or the tenebrionids. Um, the darkling beetles, if you are looking for a common species, would be your mealworms. All right, good. That's what I like to hear. I'm sorry there's been some laggy problems. I'm glad you guys have stuck it out with me. All right, might as well check out. So the microscope might feel a little bit laggy just as I'm trying to kind of focus the camera. Um, but once I get there, it should be mostly, it, it, it should stay in focus. I guess I could kind of pre-focus it for you. A lot of times tenebrionids or darkling beetles are dark colors. They tend to be dark brown, dark black. They don't tend to have a lot of other colorations. Some of them in Arizona will have like a, a really dark red stripe on them or two. This guy, we're trying to look at the eye. So let's see right about here right about here you can see that this is their his compound eye so he's got all those little facets in there Ooh, excuse me all right so he's got all those little facets in there and you'll notice that the eye is we like to call it reniform or kidney shaped right so it's not this completely spherical there's this there's this notch in his head or this um we call it a, uh, a ridge, a frontal ridge, and it's notched into the antenna, or it notches into the eye. Now, the antenna also, also is connected 
um, underneath the frontal ridge. All right, so if you imagine this ridge going from the mouth all the way back down to the eye, it's got these compound eyes that have this notch and it has antenna that connect underneath that ridge or the connection is generally concealed under the ridge. These um, darkling beetles, the ones that I have here, the darkling beetles that I have here are fairly large, right? Um, but the darkling beetles that come from mealworm beetles are very small. They tend to be, I don't know, maybe like a, a half inch or smaller. But this is my dark, this is the darkling beetle from, um, from out west. He's not gonna focus that way. We've got those two characteristics. Those are fine. You guys heard of blister beetles? So blister beetles are in the family Cantharidae. And they have this name Cantharidae. Wait a minute. I lied. I don't know where my head is. Maloids. I lied, guys. We're going to talk about the Maloids. Those guys are the blister beetles. I think the Cantharids were the, yeah, the soldier beetles. We already did those. All right, so we're talking about blister beetles. Now, blister beetles are in the family Meloidae, but they release a chemical called cantharidin, which is why cantharidy jumped into my head, all right? Um, cantharidin is the chemical that they release that can um, give you acid burns, essentially, on your fingers, right? It'll kind of turn your skin dark, um, and it can actually blister a little bit, depending on the, um, depending on the family. It gives you, like, a little acid bubble. It's kind of grody. Um, there are many, many, many species of blister beetles, and the variety in them is kind of awesome. Um, I collected, I was in you not utah new mexico probably i was in new mexico this summer and i stopped at a rest area and i picked up like six species of blister beetles so we're gonna go through them really quick um the blister beetles a lot of times their um head tucks down um, when they're startled or after they die. So when they're on the pin, that's kind of easy to see, that you can kind of see that their head kind of bows down a little bit. Um, but also, but also the pronotum um, is very narrow. And it appears kind of neck-like. So I'm leaving these guys in the unit tray because I'm going to try and show you a bunch of them. I'm going to go across the row. All right. So you can see that his head slants down, right? You can only see you can only see really the top of his head. This is the pronotum right here, and you can see that it is narrower both it's narrower of the, than the head and it's narrower than its elytra or these shoulders right here. A lot of times blister beetles are going to have these shoulders. Right? Narrow neck, wide shoulders, head kind of facing down. This one is a cool one. I like, um, I like this blister beetle because it's a lightning bug mimic. <clears throat> You can see that it has these dark, um, these dark elytra with these lines in it, and then the lighter colors on the pronotum and on the head. Those are colorations that you would generally see on a lightning bug, except you know that you can see the head from above. 
and you can't see the head from above with actual true lightning bugs, right? <clears throat> true lightning bugs, their pronotum, this piece right here, goes all the way from edge to edge and expands in front of the head. Whereas blister beetles, you can see the head. I think that's pretty good camouflage. If it takes that much explaining to tell the difference, you know? All right, you can see the neck and the head facing down. You can start to see that they definitely have this very um, unique body shape, even though they can come in a variety of colors. They can be, they can be these orange with the yellow and black stripes, the cute little dots, love those guys. These guys are super gray when you find them, and um, I love these stripes. These guys are kind of startlingly gray. Um, they almost blend into cement. The coloration is a little yellow on the microscope right now. There we go. All right, so, and I think there's one more species we haven't looked at. That one we've seen a couple times now. This one. Cool. Awesome. So all blister beetles, they're going to have a head that faces down after they die or when they're startled. Also, their mouth parts generally always face down anyway. Um, the pronotum is narrow, right? Looks like a neck. It has um, a wider head and wider elytra than its pronotum. Easy enough, right? Now don't pick them up. Because if you pick them up, then you might get, um, then you might get that chemical, you might get a chemical burn. I can't tell you how many times I've been burned by these guys. Um, well, I have a handful of them, so I like to collect them. And these aren't all of, I had a, um, I had a significantly larger collection just a couple years back. I unfortunately lost my entire collection. So that's what I've been doing now is I'm rebuilding my entire collection. Um, I have a handful of specimens that are really old, but 90% of my collection is gone. So it's fun restarting it. You know? The Cerebicids. Longhorn beetles. All right. Um, the longhorn beetles have long antenna. All right. And when I say long antenna, I mean really long antenna. Like, Longer than the body, generally, right? So their antenna are, they, they can project out very, very far, or they can pull their antenna back. And when they pull their antenna back, generally their antenna go at least three quarters of their body and most of the time way past their body. All right, super long antenna. That's why they got their name. They also have those same notched eyes like the um like the darkling beetles had all right so we're going to be looking at their notched eyes and their long antenna now um dig this out all right so you'll see that there are a number of them that have very long antenna this one up here let's see this one right here this is in the genus prionis and it is, um, you'll, you'll notice that its antenna are not as long as most of the other longhorn beetles. Like this one down here, um, I have that one's identification down to species. I wrote it down in my book. That one is Stenapsis solitaria. So this is Stenapsis, <clears throat> and you can see that its antenna go significantly longer than its body. In fact, if I hold it like this, you can see it goes above its body. And I tried to make them as even as possible when I was pinning this guy. The thing is, longhorn beetles have such long, um, have such long antenna that uh, they tend to break. And you don't want your specimens breaking, that's sad. And so I end up, um, tucking a lot of legs, right? Tucking the legs to try and protect them. And then getting the antenna as close to the body as I can without it projecting too far around, right? So if I had taken these antenna and I had straightened them all the way back, if I had put them straight back, 
there would have been a lot of antenna out in the open um, in the back waiting to be hit and knocked off. And that's no good. I tell you, every time I interact with my collection, I break something off. All right. That's kind of, it's like sad, but also kind of a, a part of owning an insect collection is, is learning like which things you probably should glue back on and which things you don't have to glue back on, <laughs> right? I glued a leg back on to, um, to a diving beetle earlier today. Um, but if it was a labial pelt or an antenna of that beetle, I may not have glued it back on. All right, we got a handful of more. Just those guys up top are longhorn beetles. All right, I wanted to show you the really big ones in person before we got to the colorful ones that we're looking at under the microscope. We're going to pick one, let's see, the red one is pretty, that one is pretty, you know what, let's do the locust core. All right, this is a locust borer, it is a species of longhorn beetle, all right. Um, the antenna are not incredibly long, but they are at least half the length of the body, okay? Um, so that's one characteristic done. And the other characteristic is in those eyes. And so if we want to look really close, I picked this guy because he's not all black. Finally, we have a beetle that we can look at the eyes and say, there's definitely a notch in this eye. So you can see that it's a reniform shaped eye. The antenna is notched into this compound eye, right? So if it was straight, there wouldn't be room for that antenna. That's the characteristic that we're looking at. And all longhorns have it. If you were trying to identify longhorns, um, down past their family, if you wanted to get them down into genus or species, there is, well, maybe down to subfamily and then down into genus. Um, there is a, there's a key for longhorn beetles, um, but it's not a dichotomous key. It's a, it's the other type of key. I don't remember what the name of it is, um, but there's another type of key that's not a dichotomous. So it doesn't say, it's not like you have this choice or this choice, A or B. It's more like they give you a whole list of characteristics and then you go through the characteristics and you pick and choose which ones you see on your specimen. And then over the choice, over the, over the course of time, that will actually narrow your specimen down into the right, um, into the right family or into the right species, depending on what you're identifying down to. <clears throat> hey guys, we're closing in on the end of our coleops, on the end of our beetles. Let's see. We have, what do we have left? We have chrysomelids, so we have the leaf beetles. We have the brentids or the, the short snouted weevils. And we have the curculionids, we have the weevils. So we only have three families left. We're going to do the chrysomelids. Oh no, close that. Still good. Okay. All right, these are the chrysomelids. They are their common name are leaf beetles and they have fluffy feet. All right, um, that might be a silly characteristic, but I mean, it's a thing. If you want to say it in a more scientific way, you would say that their tarsal pads are setos. 
Um, or, yeah, that's what you would say. You could say their tarsal pads are Cetos, or you could say they have fluffy feet, which is way better. Um, Cetos is not a word that they recognize. All right, so if you are like the Google or the word dictionary and you don't know what Cetos means, um, CD are hairs. All right, so um, this is the plural. This is the plural for insect hairs, our CD. And then if you want to turn that into a description, you say Cetos. So covered in hairs is the insect. Cetos is the insect word for covered in hairs. Um, there is an actual entomological dictionary that is larger <laughs> than the Merriam-Webster's dictionary. All right. So they have long filiform antenna so they have straight antenna i wouldn't necessarily say that they have incredibly long antenna that's just one of the descriptions that some of them i guess some of them can have long antenna most of the ones that i have do not have long antenna and um we haven't talked about tarsal um we haven't talked about tarsal uh formations yet. Tarsal formulas. And this one's tarsal formula is 444. So when we're saying a tarsal formula, um, we're talking about the feet. <laughs> all right. Crisabella identification is pretty much all about the feet and the antenna. So um, they have what they call apparently 444. which is um, crossing hairs, but I'll show you what they mean by that in a moment. Um, when you're looking at insects, you've got the coxy, which is like the hip bone. You've got the femur, which is like the first segment. You've got the tibia, um, which is like the second larger segment. And then you've got the tarsi, or all of the little toes. Um, tarsi is plural for tarsal. One tarsal, many tarsi. All right, so their tarsal formula is 444, meaning that on the front leg, the middle leg, and the hind leg, they have four tarsi on each leg. Apparently four tarsi, which is actually five, but they, um, they're they silly like that. Let's look at their fluffy feet. You'll see. You'll know what I mean. It's kind of the best. <laughs> All right, let's check these guys out. <clears throat> a very dark bottom of his body so he's a little bit more difficult to see this on I promise it exists let's see if we back out a little bit we get a little bit more light we might get a better view of his little feet you know what we're gonna go up here oh we gotta go back here All right, well, we're going to try this. Um, we might also have to look at another specimen, um, but this, his tibia ends right here, and his tarsal claws, uh, his tarsi are right here. Um, now, his tarsi are very dark, so it's kind of difficult to see, but what you can see are the fluffs. So you see all of this this light coloration right here and right here? Those are the long hairs on the bottom of his tarsi that you're seeing. Um, 
So if we look at up here, we might... So the way that this insect was pinned, this is actually the top of his feet right here. So he's kind of... Um, If you imagine an insect, the bottom of his tarsal claws are right here. This insect is rotated in like this. So the fluffs are towards his body. But if you look right about here, right about here, you can see at this angle, you can see all of those long hairs at the bottom of his feet. All right, Cetos. Now, if we're talking about the formula, we've got the femur here, we've got the tarsi here, or the tibia here, and then the tarsi are right here. All right, and if we were going to count the tarsi, we can say one, two, three, four, right? And each leg is gonna look like this. They apparently have four tarsal, um, tarsal segments. One, two, three, four. Um, just like this guy would be one, two, three, and then the one more here that's a little bit more difficult to see, but it's right here. Um, four. Now, they say apparently four because at the base of this tarsal, tarsal segment, very, very end, there's actually a very, very small fifth segment that pretty much no one can see ever. And so we say that the tarsal formula is apparently 444 because as you are looking at the specimen and as you are counting the specimen, you're gonna see four tarsi, even though there are technically five, all right? And so that's why the word apparently is important because there are some insects that actually do have a 444 tarsal formula. Um, and it's not just apparent, it's true. And it's funny because you'll see that wording in the keys, which is why I use it with you guys, right? I use the word apparently. Um, doesn't, doesn't seem too scientific to me, at least. You're like, well, it's apparently like this. But it helps when you're keying and identifying things out. All right, try some melods. Brunted. Oh, no. My second computer turned off. There we are. There we go. The the Brentids are what we call the streets street snouted weevils. All right, so there's gonna be two characteristics that we're seeing. Um, the head is going to be elongated into a, um, well, it looks like a long nose, but it's not a long nose. Um, I guess we can call it a snout. Um, we're gonna put snout in quotes. <laughs> Love it. All right, and then the antenna are not elbowed. All right, they can have a variety of different types of antenna. They just cannot have elbowed antenna. So this is going to be my Brented. It is a type of weevil. All right. Um, weevils are going to be a beetle that has this long snout in the front of his head. Right. So you can see his eyes are here. This is his head. And then it continues to way out here. Well, there are insects that have long snout-like mouth parts. <clears throat> um, there are insects that have kind of long snout-like mouth parts, like, um, I don't know. Let's see. 
Who has a true snout-like mouth fart? Like a true mouth fart that's long? Maybe a mosquito. Mosquitoes have long individual mouth parts, and that whole long piece is its mouth part. Now, weevils, this extended piece is just an extension of his head, all right? This right here and this right here is actually not part of the mouth part. The mouth part is on the very, very end, all right? They have a little itty, itty, bitty chewing mouth part on the end of this snout, and the snout is just an elongation of its head. All right, because you'll notice that a lot of a lot of different types of weevils will have um, their antenna that connect to the snout area. Right, so the antenna never connect to the mouth parts. Now, this is not a curculionid. This is not a normal type of weevil. Normally, weevils are going to have elbowed antenna. And if we zoom out a little bit to check out these antenna, you can see that there is not a place in this in, in these antenna where they bend at 90 degrees, right? These antenna look more filiform. And I'm giving you a little bit of a zoom up and a zoom down just so that you can get a feel for what it looks like along the path, but you can see there is no 90 degree bend on that mouth part or on those antenna. All right, so those two things, they have a head elongated into a snout and they have the antenna that's not elbowed. Those are the Brentids or the straight snouted weevils. Then you have the snout beetles or the snouted weevils. Those are the culeonids. We're just gonna call them weevils. We can call them the basic weevils even. <laughs> These are the original weevils. These are the OG weevils, all right? Um, and OG weevils have elbowed antenna, always and forever. Always and forever have elbowed antenna. And their head is elongated into a snout. So if you were going to confuse a weevil a weevil with something, it would be a brented or a straight snouted weevil. All right. Change the angle of this really fast. Yep, this kind of works, but it doesn't work for everything. All right, we're going to have to look at this one on, in two different poses, I think. And the weevils are actually the last family that we're doing, guys. So this is the, the last family that we're looking at. Um, so this is, I promise you that it's a weevil. He doesn't have as long of a snout. He does not have as long of a snout as most weevils do. All right. So this Curculiana, this weevil, you can see his eyes are back here, and his head is extended into this, into a snout. It's not a very, very long snout, right? Um, but it still exists, and you'll notice that it has this first segment, and then the uh, antenna bend at a 90 degree angle up here. All right. And so they have these elbowed antenna, and all weevils, all true weevils, are going to have elbowed antenna. This guy, let's see, I wonder, you can probably see his antenna. This is a weevil with scales all over its body. I actually, it's a yucca feeding weevil. Let's see. I think this guy's cute. He was a guess that bug one of the weeks. His snout is a little bit more difficult to see from above because his snout kind of um, folds down underneath his head. Cute. All 
right. So you can see these are his compound eyes right here. And stay. All right, so you can see that these are his compound eyes up here. His head is here and it continues down. So this is where his, this is his snout down here and his antenna connect to the snout, right? So we know the snout's not, snout is not part of the mouth. It's just the extension of the head. Um, and you can see right here, it bends at a 90 degree angle. All right, so that is a pretty easy diagnostic character for all weevils. If you see that it has a snout and you think, aha, that is probably a weevil, you've got to check for the elbowed antenna to make sure that it is not another family kind of trying to trick you into being a weevil, right? Because weevils, this family, the Curculionids, are not the only family with snouts. I really like that you can see all of the definition. These are individual, they're going to be called hairs or CD, but they also probably can be called um, scales, right? Because they're flat and wide. Um, so this beetle's at weed weevil is actually covered in scales, which is kind of nifty. guys that only took three and a half hours <laughs> no biggie um so i i honestly i hope you guys so much enjoyed and learned from and learned from the live stream um i love doing them i live stream on um tonight is a tuesday night normally i do monday nights all right so next next week it'll be monday night um, and then I live stream on the day during Thursday. Um, I generally start around two and normally I only go for about an hour, hour and a half. Sometimes I'll close in on two hours. Um, this is a super special live stream because I was considering ending it about halfway through and then you guys joined me and I was so excited. So we decided to stay and hang out and I appreciate it. Um, awesome. So there are more things to come with my collection. Next time we see each other, we'll, well, next time I'm back live streaming will be on Thursday, and we're going to be going through the families of a lot of the minor orders of insects that we haven't hit yet. So we're going to be looking at the mantis flies, um, a lot of the net-winged things, so antlions. Um, I haven't seen my... I'm going to have to look. We, yeah, we've got lace wings, caddisflies, stoneflies, mayflies, um, all of those type of smaller orders. Those are what we're going to be going over on Tuesday. Um, and then we'll probably do the lepidopterans, so we'll do the butterflies and the moths. We will eventually run out of orders and families to identify down into, and I do plan on continuing to ID the insects further and further. So um, <clears throat> now that we've got kind of the basics down for the families of beetles, when we go, when we come back to the beetles, we'll be able to say, all right, let's look at all of the leucanids. And we're going to try to identify the leucanids, I don't know, down to subfamily or down to genus or maybe even down to species, depending on, depending on the research and the availability of, of keys and the availability of the, of, of identification guides. Um, some things are very easy to identify to species, like the um, like the Chrysina, the jewel scarabs that we saw today. Those are already identified down to species. But then there are things like I have six I have six dwarf grasshoppers. They're in the family Tetrigid. They're only like this big. They're really cute, except I can't find a key for them. I don't know how to get them down past that they are dwarf grasshoppers. So I'll be trying to figure out that if we, if they're supposed to be subfamily or genus, that type of stuff. Um, so then, I don't know how many of you guys actually make collections out there, but I do have a variety of insects in alcohol right now that still have to be pulled out and pinned. Um, so I wanted to get this part of my collection sorted and organized and prepped and labeled. Um, 
Um, and then we'll be able to go back and, um, and we'll be able to go back and we'll be able to pin a bunch of new specimens and resort those into, um, into the collection that we've worked on. The tiny, the tetrigids, the little itty bitty grasshoppers. Oh man. I, they're, they're, they're pretty adorable. Uh, all right. Well, thank you guys for um, hanging out. I really hope that you guys, I really hope you come back. They're tiny. They are tiny and green. Here, I'll show you a tetrigid real quick. So you said that you live or are around, are you around um, Florida? I have personally, I've personally never seen a, um, okay. I've personally never seen a green a green one, but it's not, it's possible, it's very much possible that they exist out there. Um, wish I had a ruler. I need to write, oh, I've got a ruler. Because I was trying to measure about, all right, so this guy, he's about a half inch long. Let's see. Um, all right, so this guy, this is a little dwarf grasshopper, and he is only about a half inch, he's only about a half inch long. Um, the character, so if you were, if you were curious, yeah, maybe about two, maybe about two millimeters, let's see. Oh, that's, that's real tiny. Yeah, I'd love to see, I'd love to see a picture of one. I might be able to help you identify them. I love identifying bugs, is what I do. Um, and so the characteristic on tetrigids, if you want to see really quick on dwarf grasshoppers, we talk a lot about the pronotum of different insects, right? This first segment of the thorax that either guards the head, sometimes it's very small, and tetrigids, the pronotum doesn't expand forward to protect the head. It actually expands backwards to protect the wings. So this is the pronotum up here, but then it extends all the way back and it doesn't end till about here-ish. Yeah, it's right about here where, where the, um, the actual pronotum ends and then it comes back. And this part is very hard. It's um, solid, so it actually helps protect those wings. That's going to be the characteristic for all dwarf grasshoppers. They have that expanded pronotum, or they have an expanded pronotum that protects the wings. Right. All right, my uh, my head's starting to get a little fuzzy. It's uh, after midnight now, just a little bit tired. <laughs> okay, so um, I look forward I look forward to seeing everybody again on Thursday if you can make it, and if not, come back come back next week and see me um, and see me late night. <laughs> Aw, I mean I could hang out with you a little bit longer. Are there other bugs you wanted to chat about? You could probably convince me into staying. <laughs> but, um, yep, yep, yep. I think we got all of our, I'm so happy we got all the beetles done. All right. 
Um, I will, I'll talk to everybody, I'll talk to everybody again, um, I'm in Sectopia, find me on, well, find me on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, I exist out there in the world, and I'd love to interact with you and talk about bugs and pictures and all of the things, so, um, signing out, and I hope you guys all have a wonderful rest of your night, bye!